Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It has been a week since the Perseverance rover landed on Mars and sent back its first images from its hazard cams, to which many people responded by saying, this is a $2 billion spacecraft, why is it only sending black and white images? And of course, yes, those first images were black and white, but for the first time, those hazard cameras on a Mars rover are in fact color. So this is a bit of a step forward. I want to talk about like how color cameras and imaging technology actually works in spacecraft because strangely enough, per Perseverance is one of the first uh, spacecraft to actually have color sensors in such quantity. Because you know what? There's really good engineering reasons to use monochrome sensors. And you know, to understand this, uh, you, we got to compare cameras to what we carry around with us every day, right? Many of us have something like this. This is an iPhone X. It has a pair of cameras in it and they have 12 megapixel sensors on them. Now, imaging sensors, you are basically little microchips that are you know, created in fabrication facilities. And what they'll do is they'll have a, a layer which when it gets hit by a photon, it knocks an electron out and then that electron builds up with its buddies in a little capacitor to create a small amount of electric charge. And then at some point you can read out that electrical charge as a value and convert that into an image. Now these photodiodes are not color sensitive. So what you'll then do is you'll have uh, filters that sit on top that mean that say only red gets through. So you'll get red pixels, blue or green, right? And for consumer cameras, what they do is they have a, an array of filters called a bear mask. It's named after the person that invented them. So if you imagine your sensor is covered by lots of tiny little filters and typically uh, you'll find them in blocks of four. So you'll have like red, green and blue. Uh, and maybe the fourth one could either be another green or a white or there's many different kinds. But the point is your image sensor now has color applied to all these pixels. And to be clear, 12 megapixel sensor doesn't mean you have 36 megapixels of uh, color of actual sensors because the color data is at a different resolution from the actual luminance data because your eyes are actually not that good at detecting detail in color. And I could make a great comparison, but you know what? It would probably be ruined by the fact that video codecs and image codecs just simply account for the fact that your vision is really bad at seeing color resolution. So yeah, these, all these pixels, they go into something called a, a demosaicing process, which renders out and collects the color and creates these nice images that we can then share on our favorite social media. So anyway, that is the sort of consumer level sensor. But on a spacecraft, um, there might be cases where you don't want to have this, this color support because think about it, you're putting little color filters over all your pixels. That means you're throwing away photons that would otherwise create imagery. If you want to have the most sensitive uh, imager, then getting rid of that filter means you can have shorter shutter rates or better signal to noise ratio, depending upon where you're going. And actually, also say you're working on something like a, a hazard camera system that's going to be doing stereographic imaging. Uh, then you might not need that color. In fact, that color might make your algorithms harder. So you would go with uh, monochrome imagers. Truthfully though, the reason why Curiosity had mainly monochrome cameras was because most of the cameras were designed for the Mars Exploration Rovers and they just copied those designs over. Whereas Perseverance, they had to pretty much redesign all the cameras because getting the parts to build these old camera designs was getting harder and harder. So they went with new engineering cameras using off the shelf parts and they decided finally color was something they could go for in this case. So yeah, Perseverance, most of the engineering cameras are off the shelf color, you know, sensors with uh, bear masks and you know, custom uh, lenses. But the science cameras, those use a completely different system. You see, yeah, if you're taking images of stuff, maybe you want to have that high signal to noise. Um, but yeah, for your science cameras, what they do is they use uh, global filters. So they have a wheel that lets them select different color filters and apply that to the whole sensor. So they will select the red uh, filter, take a picture, green, take a picture, blue, take a picture, and then 
merge those all together into one higher quality image. This is great because it means you can no longer, no longer get any weird issues with color resolution being different from luminance resolution. But also, having a filter wheel with only three filters is kind of lousy. It's, like, it's a wasted opportunity. You could fit so many more filters on there. And of course, science cameras do this. You'll get filters that cover the infrared range, filters that cover ultraviolet. You'll get narrow band filters that look for specific elements. Uh, and so you can build up images of these scientifically interesting things. And of course, then construct false color images using this data. So that's the way that most astronomical or spacecraft images have been taken in deep space. Uh, if you look at Galileo, Cassini, Voyager, all of these col the color images taken by these spacecraft have used filter wheels. Now there is a slight problem with this in that because you're taking three images in sequence, if anything changes between that, that then you will get false color. And that's generally not a problem on, say, Mars, because it's very easy to get a rock to sit still to, you know, take its portrait. In deep space, it's a little harder because you're moving and you might have slightly different viewpoints between targets. So since I'm mentioning Voyager, uh, I should also point out that Voyager was from the old era where they didn't have solid state image detectors for the cameras. Instead, they used Vidicon tubes. So these are the way old TV cameras used to operate. They have... Uh, obviously have an image plane where the photons knock electrons out, they accumulate as a charge, but instead of reading it out with wires, you're reading it out with an electron beam that scans across this, and I guess they read out the signal that way. So that's how old cameras used to operate, and they were really hard to calibrate, and they were fragile, and everything else. But Na NASA moved over to solid-state imagers in the 80s and never looked back. <laughs> And I guess I should also point out that there's two main types of uh, solid state sensors. There's CCDs and CMOS. And Perseverance is one of the first you know, NASA spacecraft in deep space to really heavily use CMOS sensors for its engineering cameras. Uh, the names really don't tell you very much. One's called, one, CCD means charge coupled device. CMOS means complementary metal oxide semiconductors, which is actually just the way they manufacture it, not the way it's done. I prefer the term active pixel uh, sensors. Um, and so what you have, again, is these little image photodiodes that collect charge. But in a CMOS sensor, you read it out by having the electronics that sits next to the pixel. There's a little amplifier there and a wire that goes to the edge. And so you can ask each of these things to read out its value, just like you'd be reading out memory, except you're reading out an analog value, right? With CCDs, they don't have the electronics right next to the sensors. Instead, they have the amplifiers and readout along the very edge of the chip. But they have the ability to copy the charge from one pixel to the next pixel. So what they can do is read out a pixel at the edge and then step all the pixels along and then read out the next pixel. So they stack these along, push them off, and then read those out. And I guess the advantage of CCD in this case is that you don't have to spend space on your image plane for all these like extra electronics. Those are all out of the plane, so you can get better imaging sensitivity. You know, more of your sensor is sensors. There are other advantages in that, like if you want to cool your sensor way down for say, do getting really good infrared, then that might actually break certain electronics there. So it's better to, so that, that makes that impossible. But really these days, CMOS is everywhere. Almost all the advantages in terms of signal to noise that CCD once enjoyed have fade, faded away because the consumer market is so powerful for developing good high-tech stuff. However, there is a class of color imager, which are imager in general, which uh, really benefits from CCDs and their ability to move uh, image you know, data around while they're taking their photo. So there's a type of imager called a push broom imager. And what this is, is like a scanner or a fax machine or a photocopier. That instead of snapping a full frame in one shot, what it does is it scans the uh, sensor across the target 
and builds up an image that way. And that works really well if you have a spacecraft flying over the surface or orbiting the surface of a planet and you're just wanting to take a scan of the terrain as it moves underneath you. So that's how a push broom imager works. Now, you might think then there's like a single one pixel wide sensor there that's taking these images, but that has a problem in that because you're moving, say, at five kilometers per second over Mars, and you're wanting maybe half meter resolution, that means your shutter rate would be one ten thousandth of a second, otherwise you would get motion blur. So you can solve this using a CCD where you have a much wider sensor and as you move across the surface, you use the CCD's capability to step the image across, or step the recorded image across the sensor matching the speed of the vehicle, right? And this is how you'll get see these working. There's one that's on Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter in the high rise camera. Uh, you'll have see this on Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, same thing. And, and I think it's telling to look at the high rise image plane because you can see these slightly staggered sensors like that and they're all reading out their own individual strips which are then converted to image. But in the middle, you have three of these in parallel because of course you wanna get color. So you're getting your red, green, and blue, although in this case, it's not actually red, green, and blue. They're like, uh, they're, I can't remember, but they're different, but you've got three colors so they can build up these sort of true color images. And that's been very successful. Although again, because these are at slightly different places, they're taking images at slightly different times. And that means there are, are actually a few cases where you can see this. And there's one that was discovered by Doug Ellison again, where there were little puffs of smoke or dust being thrown up by rocks falling off a cliff. And when they hit, the red, green, and blue channels on the images were slightly different times. So you could actually see the animation of these expanding clouds of dust. Yes, I mean, that's, that's one example. Uh, another example, actually, is the Juno cam on the uh, Juno spacecraft. Now, this was a much, much smaller camera that was added, and it was supposed to be for science outreach, and it's produced very beautiful images, but it had to be small and simple. So instead of having three separate CCDs for you know, different wavelengths, what they did was they got a monochrome CCD, and they just put different filter bands over it. So there's one section that's green, one that's red, one that's blue, and there's one for like infrared methane bands. And because they can move the data around while they're taking the photo, they can read this out, they can get good images. And this is, it's, it's great because of course it made a very simple camera and it operates by this sort of cool method. So I guess there's one final thing I wanna mention is that while we use filters to get red, green, and blue, there are theoretically ways to make image sensors where the entire pixel can respond to red, green, and blue and can differentiate. And this is the technology that Sigma use in their digital SLRs. They use something called the Foveon sensor. And the way it works is you have multiple layers of photodiodes in it. And certain, basically the way in which, or the depth to which the photons go before they hit one of these, depends upon its color. So you're gonna get slightly more blue light at the top and then the blue light gets filtered out and you get more red light in the bottom. So you have, you can look at the ratios and try to guess what the colors are. And many people love these cameras. They pr produce colors that are much more true for some people. However, the downside right now is that they have very, very narrow operating shutter speeds. If you overexpose or underexpose, you get very bad colors. And the other thing is that if the color differentiation between the three layers is pretty weak, as I understand it, so you have to sort of turn the saturation up, and that means you get more signal to noise, or more noise rather than less signal. And that, that that's why these cameras haven't really caught on. And we're still living with, you know, Things like this, which have really great cameras, but they're using all sorts of optical tricks to hide the fact that they're not taking full resolution, color, and image, and luminance at the same time. So yeah, that's why most spacecraft have black and white cameras still. I'm Scott Manley. 
fly safe. <laughs> <laughs>